Hey guys, welcome to a very special event, a co-production of my podcast, Happy, Sad, Confused, and the Metaverse. Now, usually on my podcast, we talk about other guests' comfort movies, but today we're talking about one of mine, the brilliant and audacious Mad Max Fury Road. I am beyond thrilled to welcome back to Happy, Sad, Confused for this fifth anniversary retrospective all the way from Sydney, Australia, the genius that is, the writer and director, George Miller. Hi, George. Hi there. Wow, thank you. I'm thrilled to catch up with you, even in these crazy times via Zoom. Um, You know, I I remember, you know, we're going to revel in all things Mad Max Fury Road today. The last time I spoke to you was when the film was coming out. And one of the things you actually said to me in that conversation was you can really measure a film by how long it follows you out of the theater. Um, Well, mission accomplished, (laughs) I would say, because (laughs) as much as it was revered at the time, Fury Road is now, I feel like, even more revered and, and acknowledged as, as just a stone cold classic. I, I just I was wondering if we could start there. Like, how does it feel that five years in, the estimation of this film has only increased? Well, obviously it's very gratifying. You don't know what's gonna to happen to a film. You put all you know into the process. I mean, everything you know. At the end of the film, you're pretty spent and you think, and you're never sure, there's always uncertainty. And this film in particular, until it was all together in a very mature state, literally every sound effect, every, every frame was basically significant in the overall rhythm of the piece. So until it gets in front of audiences and until, until, until it has a chance to marinate, as it were, in, 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 in people's minds, um, it's ultimately the audiences that tell you what your film is. And I'm very, very thankful that we're still talking about it because, uh, because the default position is usually the opposite. People forget it not too long after they left the cinema or in these days, you know, to turn off their television. I mean, I have to say, on, in, uh, this is not hyperbole to say, but the filmmakers that I've talked to in the f- five years since, there's no movie that's come up more, that they bring up more as... And the adjectives they use, the, the, the words they use to describe the film are, you know, it seemed impossible. It's a miracle. How did, how did, that, how did that film happen? I, Steven Soderbergh had this amazing quote where he said, I don't understand how they're not still shooting that film. I don't understand how hundreds of people aren't dead. <laughs> and this is Steven Soderbergh, who knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. So that, that's, a, that's a significant thing to so. say. So I, I guess my, 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 my silly but serious question is, was this movie as difficult as it looks to make? Oh, yes. Um, look, every movie, even a small movie, even a bad movie, even a, you know, a, a vis- big visual effects movie, it, they're always difficult and they should be difficult. Otherwise, there's no effort. They're never casual. Uh, and, and, and so, yes, it... it it's, um, it's a little, you know, I, I was bewildered when I first made my first feature. I thought I wasn't cut out to make movies because it was so unpredictable. The best laid plans all went wrong. And it wasn't until I spoke to Peter Weir, actually, who'd done, an Australian director, a great Australian director, who had done already two features. And he said to me, George, um, don't you realise it's always like that? And it wasn't long after the Vietnam War. He says, think about it, think about it as if you're going into patrol. Uh, you're on patrol in the, in the jungle and you've got your platoon and you've got to get through your mission and, and you won't know where the snipers are. You won't know where the, where the landmines are. You don't know where, who's going to get sick from some disease or whatever. Uh, you, none of this is predictable, and, and, but you've got to be flexible enough and agile enough to get through and complete the mission. And, I, and that really, that stayed with me all these years. And it yeah. was particularly necessary in this case. Well, I was gonna say, and the cruelty is, you would think after 40 plus years of directing films, like it gets easier, but um, it doesn't necessarily, especially when you're, you're trying to pull something as audacious as this off. Yes, I think that's the point. If, if, if it's easy, you're doing, you're repeating what you've yeah. done before. And, and, you know, I think we tend to forget uh, not only do we change, the individual storytellers change, but the audiences change and the technology changes. Yes. So if you kind of get stuck in doing what's been seen many times before, 
you're basically not really trying hard enough, I believe. And, and at least we tried with this film. And, I, you know, I'm genuinely thankful. It, 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 um, it seems to have a resonance, which is, which, which is ultimately what gives you the most uh, satisfaction. Uh, not to the point of hubris, I, I, I must say, because, because you start on your next film right. and, you, and you say to yourself, oh, my God, uh, you know, I know nothing. And, and then that's a really good way to start, particularly if it's a different film. Um, I want to go back to the beginning of the development of this film, and I actually asked for a, a few prominent filmmakers to send in some questions, and they were they were eager to ask you some questions. So I, I, here, here's one from uh, a woman who actually just collaborated with Charlize on on a great film called The Old Guard, Gina Prince Bythewood. Oh um, yeah, she's a, a big fan of yours, and she wanted yeah. to know what. what well, the it, 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 it's uh, it goes both ways. I, I've just seen, I've just watched it on Netflix. I think it is, and uh, I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was great to see. Um, her question for you is, what was the first image you saw in your head that fed your vision of this film? Well, it's interesting. It, was, it, it wasn't quite an, a, an image. I, I, I realized after a time making films, I tend to think in kind of scenes uh, or potential scenes. The images, uh, the images, are there, but they're very vague in the mist. But I remember the first moment it popped in my head. It was the late 90s. I remember I was in Los Angeles. I can't remember what I was doing, but I was crossing a, a, a traffic light. I was walking, a pedestrian, pedestrian crossing. And I got halfway across the pedestrian crossing, and this idea came to me, which was, um, which was what would happen if there was a film which was entirely on the move and there were a number of women escaping some tyrant, some, some, uh, some tyrant. And, it, it, and, and, and that little Geiger counter that says, oh, there's interesting drama there. Uh, you, you, uh, it, it, it sort of sparked there. And I remember very distinctly getting to the other side of the road and thinking, no way, I'm not going to do another Mad Max movie. <laughs> then, um, as what, in terms of what happens, I remember flying back about two weeks across the Pacific through the night, back from Los Angeles to Sydney, Australia, where I live. And I woke up in, you know, from some sleep and the movie started to play in my head. That's when the images came. And I got... I was surprised how far I got through into the movie, and um, I and there and, and and I'm not saying that was the complete movie, but that's when I start to see an image. I tend to see images more yep. than I remember words. Um, I, I, you know, it, 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 so then it's then it starts, and the, all it all works together. But I ne never forget that first walking across uh, that 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 do you call it zebra crossings, you know, with okay. the yeah, yeah, it, it was one of those. Yeah. And, fi and 15 plus short years later and 3,500 storyboards later. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, I know. I, I want to ask you about casting because you had a challenge in this film. Um, at a certain point, you decided this was not the tale of an older Max. This was a tale of a younger Max. And you had to switch uh, out of using the great Mel Gibson uh, uh, in this iconic role. Um, we spoke once, and you've been candid. You talked about Heath Ledger at one point. Was was Heath actually cast? and and what do you think he would have done with Max that would have been different? Well, sadly, we'll never know. But, uh, but, but, but um, he wasn't cast, but every time he would come to Australia to visit his family, he would call in and we'd talk. And, and, um, uh, and he... Um, and I always had it, had it in mind. Always had him in mind. Um, look, he... Look, I think... Mel, when he when I first met him, Heath, when I got to know him a little bit, and and uh, and and Tom, all have in common the quality, a kind of, it's a cliche, but a kind of uh, animal magnetism, and I mean, literally mean animal magnetism. Right. I, I, when I worked on the on the Bay movies with uh, with animals, and I got to know the animal trainers. I mean to walk up to a cage with a tiger or a big grizzly bear and, 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 uh, 
And in some cases, when they allow you in, to, uh, in there, there's this wonderful quality, wonderful thing that happens where you want to pack them and roll around with them and whatever. On the other hand, you, you're you very aware of some inner mystery that goes on. On the one hand, they're highly accessible as people. I'm talking about three guys. And, and on the other hand, there's a, they're a mystery you'll never get to never get to know them. And I think that's a, that's one of the essences of charisma and and, and uh, the paradox of that. And and they all had it. And you know, I guess they were the, 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 the Venn diagram of who they were as people and the character would have were pretty would overlap to a fairly high degree. And then in terms of casting Furiosa, I mean, this film, as we'll get to, I mean, you, you were greenlit a couple times, and I think early, uh, as early as around 2001, you were going to go into production on this film. Was it always, I mean, Charlize, that's a different age for Furiosa. Was Charlize yeah. always your Furiosa? Well, she, she wasn't the first case, because way back in 2001, I remember we asked which Charlize, you know, which Charlize read the script. And the answer is, uh, the answer came back from her agent, oh, she's not interested. Years later, when we asked her again, asked her again, she, you know, she did read the script. And I mentioned to her, did you remember getting the script way back when, you know, almost a decade before? And she said, no, I never, I never ever, uh, no, never heard of the film back then. So who knows what happens between agent and clients. But she certainly, she certainly was the first character that came into mind as we were reading it. Uh, initially, we were cast. We were, Mel was cast. Uh, we, we, things changed. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, in, both in terms of Mel's public persona with all these issues and stuff. And time went on. I'd made two animations in the meantime. The film kept on falling away. It kept on rising somehow. And the venture was made, and by then it was. I kept on thinking it wasn't like the Unforgiven about an old warrior. It, it, right. it, 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 you know, so, so Tom was the guy who walked through the door and had that same quality. Was so. was it always envisioned? I mean, it's kind of stealthily or not so stealthily Furiosa's film. Max is is obviously integral to the story, but it is really. Furiosa's arc that we really latch onto the most. Was it always conceived that way, that Furiosa would be your kind of central road warrior, as it were? Well, it, it, it emerged that way, but I don't think, I don't necessarily think it was conceived that way. I, uh, I basically, you formulate the story and you let it play out and you go through, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the process of making the film, I'm talking about the process evolving the film, writing, and so on. And characters emerge. Um, it was very, very clear that, that she had to be a woman. Uh, if there are five wives being, being basically stolen or taken away from the male principle, as it were, the, you know, the guy on top of the dominance hierarchy, and they're trying to escape that. Uh, if it was a male warrior, uh, stealing, that's a completely different story. Yep. So it had to be a female. And she had to be somebody who wasn't just a, a, a female impersonating a warrior. She had to be a warrior without any regard to whatever her, pre, you know, her, her female qualities. And, 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 and that's what happened. And, and Charlize was equal to the task. And I guess she, you know, she really, she really took to the role as difficult as it was, and she was resolute. She said, I don't, want to, I don't want to shoot a gun like I'm a woman who's just learned to shoot a gun. I don't want to hit somebody like I'm, I'm a woman and in a highly choreographed piece of work. All, all, all the fight scenes and so on were highly choreographed, but she didn't, didn't want to do it as if by numbers. And right. She was determined to do it. You know, some productions are, are, are talked in retrospect as, you know, easy and harmonious uh, um, from the start. You know, this candidly wasn't that. This was a long shoot, an arduous shoot. This went on for a while. You shot in Namibia after some false starts. Um, and I talked to a lot of your actors and, they, you know, in retrospect, they're candid. They, they say at the time, 
some of them didn't know what was in your head at the time. They say it was, it was tough for us to imagine what, what was going to be on the screen. Did you feel that at the time? Did you worry that you were losing the confidence of your actors, that something was getting lost in translation? Oh, yes, I did. I, 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 I mean, the big problem with the film, and this is not to excuse it, it was, it, it was definitely an atypical movie. There was no sort of, you could rehearse, you could rehearse the physical stuff, and you had to rehearse it. But in terms of the performances, and in terms of what was happening with the actors, uh, you couldn't really do that in any form, in any continuity. I mean, there's, there were, there, there were 2,800 cuts in the movie in 114 minutes. Right. Uh, so I think the, the, the math says that there's about 2.9 seconds, two seconds, nine frames uh, uh, per uh, average shot. So it's very hard, and, and, and action in particular, or, or, or movies that move fast, you can't do sort of the classic master so you can feel the role. Right. All the actor could do was present their character and respond to the moment, I mean, really understand the character and get immersed in their character. And that's, um, that's quite different appro approach. Uh, and we were out there in that isolated place. Yep. With, 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 uh, we started off in winter and we ended up close to summer and it was cold in the mornings even though it was meant to be it was meant to be uh, yeah. you know uh, summer and hot uh, but again eventually got hot there was dust everywhere and it i think i think it was uncomfortable for all of us but also it seeped into in, into the movie it wasn't a, a visual effects movie but yes um it was hard yeah, it was probably my fault as a director. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't express what it was going to be like, uh, uh, you know, in, in the final, uh, in, in the final cut and the, when everything was together. I couldn't sort of say this is what it's going to feel like. I could talk about the characters. I could probably talk about where they were. So um, it's it's funny to me to hear you say that because if anything there was a visual Bible like no other film has ever had one for this film. This film, for those that don't know, I don't know if you ever had a conventional screenplay, but you had 3,500 storyboards that essentially you gave to the production and the actors. So in a way, to me, it's like, that. there's your movie. Read the story. <laughs> like, you can, you can literally visualize it. Um, but I guess it's different to be on set and to be in the moment. Well, there were... There were th uh, you know, I, I don't know, 3,500, 3,800, 3, a whole room full of storyboards. But be, because after we laid down on paper a kind of a, a, a pretty detailed outline of what the story would be, we basically rendered it as a, as a story a storyboards because right. that's really the only way you can convey the causality between one shot and the next, the framing, and what was, it's just much simpler, you know, the old thing, picture. It's worth a thousand words and definitely applies to a highly visual film like this. And um, so storyboards were there, but, but there was a script. Uh, it was, uh, it, otherwise we couldn't have gone with, to a studio. I mean, people can't read storyboards. They're not like graphic novels. Right. They have a different structure. They have much more detail and they're more production, uh, you know, aid more than they are, uh, uh, they don't convey the experience of it. But we tried to do that in, in the screenplay. Uh, again, descriptive, sometimes using some pictures when it just saved a lot of detailed description. But again, there were very few words spoken. Yep. Uh, and so essentially, it was a silent movie with a lot of noise, but no dialogue, or not much dialogue. I, I hope this doesn't feel like we're, 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 rev we're, we're talking so much about the problems, because I think that that's one of the inspiring things about the film, is that even a film that, that came out as perfectly in many ways as this one did, had to go through these tough journeys to get to the, the finish line. I mean, for, for instance, I mean, I'm curious, like, did you have a low point on the film where you were like, this is getting away from me? Did you have a day where you were like, I, I've lost control of this movie? Look, I, I definitely had those days, but I learned. Uh, a little bit like that uh, being on the, you know, in platoon in the jungle with Vietnam or wherever. Right. Uh, that must happen all the time. Yep. Uh, 
I, I knew, as I said earlier, my very first film was the film where I not only felt I lost control, when, I, when the film ultimately became a surprise success, I just, I was just, I just felt I wasn't cut out to make movies. And until someone said, hey, it's the same. This is the way it is. This is it. And I've learned yeah. that, um, I've learned that uh, the hard way really, that if you, if you surrender to that feeling, if that, that um, you, you basically uh, are going to sort of lose the attention. Now, you earn the right to keep going by the work and your preparation. Right. Uh, it, it, I, I would feel completely uh, a lot, uh, that I've lost control if it wasn't so prepared, if I didn't have an idea of the whole, how each little piece of the mosaic was going to fit, fit into the whole. So you have to rely on that. Plus I, plus I knew that I had really, really great people. Uh, you know, uh, Doug Mitchell, the producer, who would jump in and, and fix any problem that he saw and try to sort of protect the film from that. And there were a lot of those things happening. Uh, Guy Norris, uh, who, who was the stunt coordinator and second unit director, really understood what we're doing, every detail of what we're doing. PJ Vogt, uh, AD, and, and uh, you know, a, a amazing man who, who, who really, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving a whole list of people that, uh, but PJ, who was also one of the producers, knew the production really well. Colin Gibson, you know, the production designer, um, all the water makeup people, everybody knew what they were doing. It wasn't, it wasn't as though it was out there we were improvising at all. We were adjusting uh, as we were going, and you, have, you always have to do that. You have to have to do that. So that's what, what you know. That, those feelings that you get, and when I, the more I talk to directors, I, I, a little story. I had a friend who was directing their first film, a very good director, and he said, "Can you got any get, got any tips?" And I said, "I said I've only got two. Always play something a little faster than you think." It should be simply, and that's from Frank Capra way back, because it, because there's a lot of adrenaline on the set, particularly. And but but in the cinema, you're watching in repose. You're sitting back and watching the movie, so it's a different. So so things will seem a little faster, perhaps, to you than it might be in the cinema. And and I said my other my other my other tip is that the day will come on your movie that you that it will not make any sense to you. You'll think you're completely crazy. And when he finished the film, which turned out to be very good, I he said, George, you remember what you told me about the day will come when I feel, I feel a little bit crazy? What you didn't tell me is, is that it would happen on every day. <laughs> so, and, and it's true in a way. And I think it's part of the, pro, part of the process. If you're prepared, if you're prepared, I think uh, that allows you to adjust and to respond very intuitively to the moment. It's exactly like the sport. A basketball player has drilled, they've got the innate talent, they drill, they drill, the team works together, but in the moment of performance, it's not a rehearsed thing. They, they have to just almost reflexively respond to the moment. Right. And that's, that's, that's when you get people doing you know, amazing um, things. My next question for you comes from uh, the great Ryan Johnson, a great writer oh. and filmmaker. Oh, and gee, it is. They're, they're wonderful people here. Thank you for this. Um, so Ryan said to me uh, on his behalf, he wanted to ask uh, you, I'd be curious specifically in the action set pieces, how much does Mr. Miller shoot specifically for a preconceived edit versus how much does he play with the footage in the edit room? You have to do both. Um, you... You, you have to preconceive it. Um, look, the film language, I, I, I won't go into too long an answer, but, but the, the, the film language was basically decided, I'm a big fan, I don't know if you know of the book, The Parade's Gone By by Kevin Brown, he wrote it in the 60s. He said something very, his basic idea was something, something very significant. This new film language, which is basically, we learned, it's an acquired language, it was determined pre-sound in the silent era. And, and if you look at the syntax of those movies, particularly Buster Keaton, 
and, and, and Harold Lloyd and those sort of silent movies were where the cameras were agile, where they were able to do a, a lot of things. They, they, did, they didn't shoot. They didn't shoot in a, in a way that, that they just shot wide masters. I mean, Chaplin shot wide masters and performed all because his, they were all from the theatre initially, but they didn't understand, they didn't necessarily, uh, well, what I'm trying to say is to do a film properly in the silent era, you had to have a way of connecting one shot to the, to the next. And you can't do an action movie unless you know what, what's happening. The feeling, the onrush of action cannot be done, in, in, it cannot be rehearsed like a one shot scene. Right. It, it can be, but it doesn't give you the intensity of what you can do when you can sort of play with the rhythms. So, yes, you have to preconceive uh, the, the, the shots, but again, you have to adjust them. When you get into the editing room, you're confronted with the, 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 the notion that you fail most of the time and, and you need an editor who is, has not only the technical skill, but the artistic skill to able to, 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 to make something really work and find its rhythms. Um, it's, uh, I, and I was very lucky to have my partner, Margaret Sixer, come there because she, 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 can, she, she is one of those editors who can see things very, very clear, see what an, an, the end result of, of, of potential readjustment of shots can be. Uh, uh, and, and, and quite often, you know, I thought I, th I thought I was pretty good with, but uh, pretty good at that. But um, but she was the one who was able to say, "Hey, George, you don't need this, and we can do this and this and this." And I'd say, "Oh, I, I can't see that, but please go ahead." I go away, and there it was. So what, so it's it, 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 it's it's sorry, uh, it's it's both those processes. I was going to say for the edit, I'm curious because one of the curious things that I think people were shocked by is your manipulation of frame rates in the film, sometimes just like speeding up and slowing down the action, um, which was very innovative. And I hadn't seen, you know, some people compared it to like watching a Looney Tunes cartoon at times or something. Um, was that something that you, again, you found with Margaret in the edit room? Or was that something always in mind? Like we're gonna play with frame rates and play with speed. That was very much in the edit room. The big difference, as I said earlier, not only do we change as audiences, uh, uh, and, and, and cinema's always evolving, and much more rapidly than we think. And one of the main things is, you know, not long ago, um, let's say two decades ago, basically the only way you could manipulate a film or work a film was the cut of celluloids, you know, between the, you know, the beginning and the end of a particular shot. Now, the plasticity is inside the frame. You can adjust the frame if you're shooting a higher resolution. We did a lot of vignettes. We did a lot of corrections. We did a lot of sharpening because eye trace is really, really important to make something play smoothly. And, and, uh, and that's, or that was all something that was done uh, in post. Uh, Margaret did a lot of that. We did a lot of it in DI. And you can't preconceive, right. preconceive that. You can't, you can't, you know, um, at the time, uh, oh, uh, well, I was going to go on. We were, we were going to shoot in, in native 3D. I remember, yeah. yes. And, uh, and I realised it was impossible uh, to do it uh, for, for a film like this. Number one, we would have only had three cameras and we would have lost them very early to dust or damage. We didn't lose any major cameras, but we had a lot of small cameras that we'd buy at the local airport in Namibia for, for about, you know, for about 1500 US dollars. And, and we put them in jeopardy and we lost, I think two or three. And, 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 and but, but if you did that without a key cameras, here's the basic problem with shooting in 3D. You cannot predict where the eye will be looking. The variable is in and out of the screen. Right. You, wouldn't, you couldn't predict where that would be. You, you, you try to predict it, but with fast cutting, you couldn't. And I'm so glad that we actually decided it was one of the most significant decisions we, we, we made was to do the, the, the 3D post. Um, but anyway, look, to answer Rian's question, uh, you have to, I believe you have to uh, preconceive the action or, or attempt to understand where the cutting would be. 
because of the causality of one shot to the next. You've got to try. Uh, and I'm I, I, looking at his films, uh, I believe he does that. I'm curious because, you know, we, you're kind of alluding to this, how technology evolves and you adapt to the technology and you use the new tools at your disposal at the time. For instance, when I look back at the first three Mad Max films, while they have obviously so much in common with Fury Road, aesthetically, there's a lot different. It, it, it just, it feels different in many ways. When you look back at the, like, would you want another crack at the first three Mad Max films using the tech today? Could you imagine approaching those three films in a much different way? Um, everything had changed. I mean, uh, I can give you so many examples, but I'll, I'll, the principal one was that you, things could be, you could do things much more safely. You could actually put, you know, there's a moment there in the movie where uh, Max is hanging upside down between the wheels of the, of the war rig, of the, 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 of the prime rig of the war rig, and, and Furioso is, is, is hooked, he's hooked, he's hanging upside down and holding him. Now, that was Tom Hardy hanging upside down. It wasn't his wonderful stuff, the double. It was him hanging upside down. He had very, very strong and thick cables and fail-safe cables and whatever, and, uh, and a very secure rig. And, the, and that was so easy to erase. I mean, that was, that was just that is a big thing. And then everyone could be harnessed. They could be on top of the vehicle going and speeding. And in other very simple ways, I remember I used to watch um, action movies, uh, really good action movies like Bullets and, and you know, I always loved uh, What's Up Doc, the Bandanovich movie. And if you look at those movies, you, you, um, you can see how many takes they did because you'd see the skid marks, several skid marks if a car did a, a, a kind of a wheelie on, on the road. You can see how many takes they did. They always used to look at the road. Now, you're shooting many vehicles in the desert and you can erase all the previous tracks. Simple things like that. Most important of all was the agility of the camera. Right. And, and you can put a camera wherever you like and, and that adds to it, camera safety. And then probably the, the, the big thing is that you, you have 45 minutes, you have a chip, inside the camera, they could, you can run the camera for 45 minutes. Now, if you have, just for instance, you have a big explosion. Uh, this is what used to happen. You, you'd have the, the biggest magazine you, you, you could get. You'd have to run it, I don't know, 96 frames a second. So you're churning up that magazine. You have to have someone turn on the camera. You have to have someone get that person who turns the camera on and get them out of there, out of your shot, and safe before you call action. Now, you're sweating because you think, oh, we're about to get to the big explosion, but the film's going to run out. And, and so that's, uh, that you don't worry about. You, lots and lots of those things. And, and, and uh, so that made, it, that made a big difference, yeah. Um, I have a couple more questions from some filmmakers I want to get in. Some we've covered in some ways, but I want to honor their questions because they were kind enough to send them in. Um, this is from the great Patty Jenkins, director of Monster and Wonder Woman, of course. Um, she says, I'm a huge admirer of the movie and your work, George. My question is, what were your inspirations for the stunning visual style of the action sequences in Fury Road? It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. How did you go about building the language for the action? Uh, gee, Patty. Um... Um, Bill, look, um, look, I, I, I remember in the past there were filmmakers who, who I admired, who said, really, there's only one perfect place for the camera at any given moment. Mm -hmm. what, what it, and when I got into animation, like with Happy Feet, the thing I discovered was that you could take I didn't discover it, it was a realization, it wasn't, weird. but you could take exactly the same performance, voice performance, you know, body animation performance, uh, lighting and everything. And by just adjusting the camera and cutting pattern, you can change the perception of the scene. And, and I learned that, and I, it, it sort of, 
got me really worried because there is only one perfect place for the camera. It's like hitting a, a note, a sweet spot on a note. Somehow, if you listen to an orchestra playing, a really trained ear can hear where the notes are off. I can't, but, but, but you know, I've certainly known people who can. I think it's the same thing. Yeah. So you have to think, basically you have to, it, 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 it play between the cere cerebral and the intuitive, and you've got to feel out not only where that, that's the perfect place for a camera, uh, but you've got to understand how, that, how we get to the next shot. It's usually yeah. story driven, but it's also in a formal way, compositional and, and, and so on. So I remember thinking of Fury Road, I think that was what made me storyboard the movie because I thought, I'm not going to go on to set and work out, uh, you know, work out on the spot how things should go, or I'm not going to sit there and talk to the second unit director and, and say, what do you think there on the day? And because you could take the same stunt, and if you don't have the camera in the right place and you, and, and you don't really think about it, uh, it could be very mediocre. And, and, the, and the proof often is when you see those making of movies, where you see... We, you see a camera there, it, you know, so, so, some crew has been put there and basically asked to step, step back because they don't, they don't want them, you know, the, the publicity crew, say, or the people making the documentary, they, you know, they can't be there. They can't have, find the sweet spot for the camera. And the stunt, or particularly a fight scene, you see the mat or you see, you see you know, the mat that the actors fall on. You see all that and it's not as dynamic is when you actually see it in the cinema, when it's fully formed. So I think, um, yeah, I think you really, you, you really have to, I, I think the, the, the question is, a, a simple, I mean, it's amazing. Paddy and, and the other directors you're talking about, I see it in their work anyway. And <laughs> I, um, if, if it's, you know, I'm glad to be able to, to, to re, reinforce that, um, yeah. Another question from another great filmmaker. This is also about the language. I'm not sure if he's talking about the visual language again or maybe the literal language, but let's let's tackle it. This is from M. Night Shyamalan, of course, the writer-director of Six Sense, wow. with so many yeah. great films. You, you know all these directors. That's I have the privilege of getting to talk to these guys, so yeah. I hit them up. They were eager to talk to you, sir, um, through using me as a vessel. Um, there are, he says, there are the rarest of films that have mastered their language to such an extent that they make us fluent when watching right away. As the storyteller, what would Mr. Miller credit the main reasons for this mastery of language on Fury Road? Now, I, I'm not sure not Knight's particular angle, but the one I'm curious about, if you'll indulge me, is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the literal language in the film that you like mediocre, witness me, all the, all the language that, that kind of like whizzes by us that we absorb and feels authentic. And if we don't understand it at first, by the end of the film, it always makes perfect sense. Um, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about how you create such a cohesive language in a film like that. Well, well putting, putting the film language, the actual structure of shots and so on aside, um, you, you know, to make a film where you have at least a thousand people working on the film and some very, very great talents, um, but you have to make them, you have to find a way to make them cohesive. Um, and for instance, we had, you know, I'm, re I'm really glad because they all won Academy Awards. We had Colin Gibson, the production designer and his team. We had Jenny Bevan, the wardrobe uh, designer or costume designer. And we had Leslie Van Walt. Now, Leslie did all the makeup and so on. Now, she, they all basically, very busy departments had a massive amount of work to do. And they have to, their work has to be unified by some very clear strategies that you, that you come up with. Um, and that's probably one of the most important jobs of the director is you're trying to harness all these different creativities. Um, and, and so basically, you know, for, for, and it takes a while sometimes to find this. Basically, for Fury Road, it, it, we, we basically said, look, uh, the world, this post-apocalyptic world, we had to, we, we had to 
decide that everything was made from found objects, repurposed. And that was one rule. The second rule, well, it's not rules, they're tools. I, I don't <laughs> like the term rules. Um, the, 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 the second notion was that just because it's the wasteland, it doesn't mean that people don't make beautiful things. Um, that, that was very important because you look at human behavior and we see that no matter how impoverished we are or how reduced we are in, in resources, even early man made beautiful things. Uh, and often it's more important when you've got very little to, 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 to so there's always the aesthetic. And the, the third one and the less important was that everything had to have more than one purpose. So this applied to the language as well. It, the language, as you know, there's always slippage in language, there's always drift in the way that language evolves in every language. And, 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 and so the language had to, had to be found objects repurposed. So the, the, the warm boys, and, and, and this is in passing, people either pick it up or not, but the warm boys call themselves camera crazy war boys, you know, for obvious reasons. And even the word, word mediocre, is used in, in, in a way that perhaps is not, is not sort of typical, has other meaning. Uh, so when we go into any culture, if you look at an anthropological movie and you go into any culture and you don't know what some of the rituals are of, of a culture that you are familiar with, but you, you do understand that the people in the film uh, know what everything means. So I think we applied those sort of things. And that's, that's how I think we got, we got there. We, you notice probably uh, there's no modern day expletives in the movies. If, if they use that, it, it makes it too colloquial. It makes it too, too, too present. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so there's a dissonance between something that you're expecting people to sort of uh, you know, take themselves into some future dystopian world and yet they're using the language of the street to that. We talked a bit about the edit and the challenges for, for Margaret Sixel in, in, in crafting this. Um, Charlize says that the initial cut she saw was four hours. Um, the f final film is two hours. That's a lot of footage that didn't make the final cut. Um, what, can you say any sequences or, or, or what, the, what the big chunks that came out of this film were? And would you ever entertain, we saw the, the Chrome version, would we ever, could we ever see a longer version of Fury Road? Well. Look, when you're making a film this, like this, you cannot afford to shoot scenes that you know won't be in the movie. So the version, I'm not sure it was four hours, but it, it, it could have been, uh, was, was basically extended shots, extended shots which were ultimately in the movie. There's, it, it's not as though we had to lift complete sequences or, or whatever. I, I, I've experienced that before in, um, you know, in television sometimes, but I've never experienced it in, in a feature film because it's so hard won the footage to do it well, that to have to lift scenes, uh, in, in a way, you know, we always say, if you don't lick the problem in the writing, you have to lick it in the, in, in the editing room. If you don't lick it in the editing room, then the audience, has to lick it for you, and that's not their job. And, and, and I, I, it's true, you have to try to deal with it in the writing. So there were, there were scenes, there were scenes that I thought were, were important, and I liked the way we shot them, and that, this is what I meant by Margaret, she saw immediately which scene uh, you, you, you could drop. And, and, and there was one, for instance, uh, that really comes to mind, and these are the sorts of things, this is probably the biggest scene that we, the, that we lost. Uh, it'll give you an example. But just to make it clear, most of it was trimming and cutting existing shots. Okay. So there was a scene where when Max says to Furiosa, we should go back. Um, and they kind of clasp hands. So these two mortal enemies, as it were, basically decide the only way we're going to survive in the way is joint forces. Okay, that's the end. That's basically the end of the classic, classic end of the second act. What I, then, then we had around there, 
a scene where the Immortan Joe was having this sort of big rally with his uh, with his uh, war boys, and they were, they were thumping and chanting, they were thumping their vehicles and banging things together, and they were, you know, basically like a political rally. And he was there, angry and whipping them up. We had that scene. Then we had a scene where where uh, and he's basically telling them all go out across the wasteland and look for tracks he's, so it was continuing the story then we had a scene where the war rig arrives up on top of the hill above ab above the the wasteland and and we see that max is there he pops up through the roof with his binoculars and he sees what's out there he reconnoit reconnoiters as it were he signals to Furiosa. You see the Vavellini uh, hanging off the vehicle like shotgun riders. You see the motorbike pull up alongside and, 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 and the character played by uh, uh, Megan Gale with Valkyrie. She's riding on the back of the motorbike. And they all look at each other ready for the battle. Then you see the Morton Joe uh, singing to himself. And... Um, and in repose until someone says, hey, is that the war rig? Because in the background, you see the war rig going by. Okay. Now, Margaret said one day, she said, I want to try something. And she lifted the two scenes I talked about, which was so much better because here I was expositing everything. Here I was, but it was the third act. It was the beginning of the third act. The, the, the main reason why they went back is they couldn't have done anything else, both within the story. And we, as storytellers, if they kept on going, we needed more exposition. And we've just spent the first two acts expositing. You have to sort of pay off in the third scene. So we knew everybody and we knew the circumstances of what's going back. So she said, we'll lose the, the, the rally, which, which I was sort of a little bit upset about, you know, just because we shot it. I like how we shot it. And then we, and we lost that scene off the top of the hill, the record going to see. So what it is now is that Max and Furiosa clasp hands. Then, then you cut to the Immortan Joe, who you know is out there, and he's singing to himself. He has a little staff, he's sitting down. Everyone's, you know, even the Dufour is sleeping in the sling of his vehicle. Everyone is completely proposed and um, suddenly, Hey, is that the war rig? And that's the beginning of, of the chase. Way better than it would have been. There, the, that's the biggest section we lost. So I, I think I got the best of all possible worlds because I think it works so perfectly in the film, but I feel like I just watched that wonderful sequence with you describing it in such a vivid Oh, detail. okay. Oh, okay. That's, anyway, that, look, everyone goes through that. I, I'm not saying, I, I, I was particularly, uh, I think we we're particularly lucky that you could lift that scene, yeah. not only to the detriment of the film, but to the enhancement. In other words, we won much more than we lost. We lost very little. What, a lot what of time. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so what happens after? Does Furiosa rule the Citadel? What happens to the wives? What do you, is Nux becoming, is he a hero to the rest of the war boys? What do you imagine in your mind's eye happens after Furiosa? Well, well there's two ways to go that that uh, it's, I've often thought about it, but, but, uh, but there's two ways to go. One is utopian, uh, which is, which uh, is not an interesting story, really. Uh, I somehow imagined that the first thing she would do in line with that is go up and release the water so people can go below. It wasn't withheld. It's a little, she, there was, um, what's the equivalent today, a, a, a sort of a, a new deal you know, politically, um, but, um, but uh, in, in following history and following storytelling, what tends to happen, and this is from Joseph Campbell, who is, is significant, he, he, what's significant about Joseph Campbell, he, it's not just his opinion, he basically made it his business to understand all of folklore, uh, all, all of storytelling, whether it was religious text or or, or, or some some basic uh, small stories in in, in, a, in a in a you know very 
circumscribed uh, region. You know, he there were always things in common, mm -hmm. and he, he he basically basically sorry, I'm wafting on now. The main thing I want to say is Campbell said that that the usual story is that today's hero uh, becomes tomorrow's tyrant. The, the hero is the agent of change. Right. They basically relinquish self-interest in order for some common good. Okay? So, this is Campbell, not me. And he basically says, so what happens is you love what you built or saved too much and you become whole fast. You become the author, orthodoxy, you, you, you develop the dogma and basically then you have to protect it. And that tends to be the rhythm of these things. Um, I think it's probably, uh, I, I think it's probably uh, healthy uh, for instance, there's limited terms in, in, in politics in those countries that, that have it. Because you can see that, you can see the opposite happening. I'm not just talking about present day politics, you see it all through time. Sure. So in a way, I'm, I'm torn between two things. I, I believe that whatever motivated Furiosa to do this thing came from a really brave and, and, and courageous space. And I think that's presented in the movie. Uh, part of me would love that if she if she pushed the world to a more you know more equitable world. And I'm not saying to a utopia because the world has already been destroyed. The green place was more utopian. The place he aspired to was more utopian. But back in the in the Citadel, she could also turn the other way. Even though the way I see the way that Charlize played her even though she was really tough. I don't see that happening. I think she's too smart to fall into that trap. She's already seen it happen with the Morton Joe. I believe he went through the same process. He was probably a heroic character in his own time. So anyway, a good question. I haven't really had to think or talk about it very much at all. Yeah. Well, that's not, that's not the story we're going to see in the future, but if all aligns correctly, we are going to see an earlier story of Furiosa um, you know, the great news is that it sounds like it's closer to happening. Um, I'm, it's a little bittersweet because Charlize won't be playing Furiosa because you, you need a, a bit of a younger actress to tell the story you want to tell. Um, what, talk to me about what you're, have you cast your Furiosa yet? Uh, no, it, look, it's too early to talk about it. Uh, I'd love to talk about it, but, you know, I have always, <laughs> I always have this, this, this uh, slight, slight superstition, you don't want to give hostage to fortune by, by, by basically talking, uh, uh, talking about a film. Uh, you know, I, I remember I talked about Mad Max 1 uh, just before 9-11 as if it was going to happen <laughs> in a few weeks' time. It was, we're only a few weeks away. So it took, uh, you know, close to over a decade to, to get it made. So if you don't mind, I won't talk about, about it until, until it's actually concrete. Okay. Well, you know, I was meant to be shooting a film as we speak now, uh, and and of course with the pandemic, uh, you know, it stopped. Like, like everybody else, it's it's stopped a, a filming. So I, I am curious if you'll indulge me. Just I, I, this, we even talked about five years ago. You had you had two stories. It sounded like that you had kind of ready to, yeah. to continue with a, yeah. a, a Max story. Um, and the Furiosa story that we alluded to. Um, do you imagine, I mean, these movies are huge undertakings, that do you still have the itch to tell that, that Max story? Do, do, these, do, do these both exist in screenplay form, like ready to go when you're ready? Well, one, one is just as a screenplay form, and one exists as virtually a novel, uh, because we wrote it, instead of, look, uh, writing a screenplay is, is in many ways much more dramatically rigorous than writing a, a novel. You can sort of, you can almost um, free associate in a novel to some right. degree. You don't have to pay as much mind to, to the dramatic architecture of the piece. And so we, Nico Mathuris and I basically freeform that and we, 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 we got to that story. And but with Furiosa, we, we, we got to a complete screenplay. This was done almost accidentally. Uh, one of the things I talked about, Hattie, 
you know, earlier the, the, the strategies when you're creating a world. The other one was you have to you have to understand where each object, which each found object uh, came from. Right. The, the 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 people making it had to make up their own little stories. Most of them I would not have heard. Where did where did uh, for instance the hospital bedpan that the doof warrior has the, you know in his double neck guitar where did that come from right. how did he come to be in this world where, why is he wearing that sort of one, one, onesie thing that's red what, what's that around his face uh, that, that uh, you know uh, we had to understand where that would happen and the uh, or at least the actors or the main person uh, working with that had to understand that right and i think um, that's what we did with furiosa you know how did she lose her arm why, what is the green place why did she say, why is she just so desperate to get back those sorts of things with which with max why is he so burnt out and alone at the beginning of the movie those are the sort of questions that we had tried to answer so we wrote these as part of the bible got it and they exist and you know we, we uh it, 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 it's part of what, without any real intention of making them necessarily. Uh, they were just there for the actors and, and for us, right. and anyone who cared to, to look at them. Yeah. So it is, it is safe to say, so those, those questions you're alluding to, if hopefully we get to see these stories, those answers are provided. We do learn a little bit more of yeah, yes. Yarm, yeah. how she escaped the green place, how she was taken from the green place, et cetera. That's the yeah. idea. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That, that is um, a couple more questions for you, if, if you'll indulge me, and then I'll let you go, sir. You've been so generous with your time. Um, mm -hmm. Are you are you at all interested in in ha in letting another filmmaker uh, take a crack at at this world that you so beautifully created? We're talking about all these streaming shows now. Could you imagine a Mad Max world set TV show that you either show run or let someone else show run? Look, uh, I uh, I can I can we we back in the eighties. We did quite a, a bit of television and with, with, with really good filmmakers uh, who've done feature films. Uh, though it was mainly what we used to call Parish Pump, mainly for Australia specifically. They were with no regard to them being seen overseas and uh, or outside of the country. And it was a very, it, 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 it's, a, it's a great thing. Look, I have, so it's something that, I don't necessarily have the bandwidth to do it, but it's something I would really like to, to do again. I mean, I have, you know, I think, I think for a lot of reasons, the best writing, uh, as well as the filmmaking, but the best writing comes out of those writers' room where you get that sort of concatenation, I think the word is, of, of people together, all these forces coming together. And I think they interplay that you get, uh, the collective experience providing it, the, the collect, collective effort, providing it's, it's well managed, can often synergistically throw up much more than one, you know, the creativity of one uh, individual. Right. Uh, and, it, and, 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 you know, uh, for me, uh, there's so much brilliant work being done. But, you know, for me, the high watermark was, uh, was Breaking Bad. As one, I know that wasn't conceived necessarily as one piece, but if you look at the structure of the whole thing, I mean, and I think there was some mind behind that, uh, probably Vince, but, but you know, I, who was assiduous about it and collected the whole thing. So I, you know, it's not something, uh, it, 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 it's certainly something I've considered, but again, it's, it's I'm, I'm a too much to do at the moment. To, well, go, to, going back to your Joseph Campbell discussions, we, we, I, I'm itching for 50 hours of a Breaking Bad like TV show of how a Morton Joe became a Morton Joe, as you said. Oh, he, yes. He probably wasn't. He was maybe he was a nice, charming man once, and it he just was. Like I promise you, he, he was he was someone admirable in my head, <laughs> and he becomes that class, classic Joseph Campbell thing. He became hold fast and manipulative, and, 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 and you know, anyway, amazing. Well, this this is honestly. Um, I, I don't know, for me, and I think for a lot of people watching, this feels like getting a masterclass in, in filmmaking and, and, and just um, shows you how tough it is, how inspiring it is to um, tackle important, uh, um, audacious pieces of work. And the fact that this film um, 
exists is kind of a miracle <laughs> and you are the key you are the key man to thank for it and i i'm so thankful for your time today george as, as you've always been generous with me and and i hope you take as much pride as you should in in creating this work yes i look at, really appreciate that, that very much and look uh, uh, great questions could you thank all of uh, the the the, you know, the, the, the wonderful directors that have asked questions. I, I, I know, you know, I don't know if you know the term t teaching your grandmother how to suck eggs. It, it's, it's, <laughs> but I love it. I don't know. Well, well, well I feel like when, when I'm answering those questions, it's teaching their grandmothers, or my, teaching my grandmother how to suck eggs. I think it used to come from some way of sucking, making getting the shell, shell and sucking the yolk and everything out of the egg by a little hole. I don't know where it came from. Amazing. Well, as you so can tell, I feel you like I'm, I'm teaching them stuff they already know too well because it's in all their work. Yeah. Well, they, 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 you've got a, a lot of fans out there, both as just the common folk out there and the greatest filmmakers revere you. And I, and I do want to just say, I, this, if you'll indulge me on a very, um, you know, personal note. Um, I just want to dedicate this conversation. Um, my, I told you earlier, my, my dad recently passed away and I, I got a lot from my dad, including a, a real love of cinema. And um, it's, uh, it's meaningful for me. You're kind of the first thing I've done since he's passed. So I, I think you'd be happy that I'm, I'm, I'm doing something that he would love to. So, so this is for my dad. What was his name, Josh? His, his name was uh, Larry Horowitz. And he, uh, he, up until the end, could quote any... Uh, any movie and, and movie cast that he had uh, that he had ever seen. So hopefully, some of, something of him is still in me. Yes. Uh, thank you again for your time.